everyone, it's Emily Williams here, the founder of I Heart My Life and your host of the I Heart My Life show. And today we have an amazing guest with us, Farnoosh Tarabi. She's someone I connected with last year. I had the pleasure of being on her podcast and meeting her a few times in person this year. And truly, Farnoosh is one of the funniest people I know. She's one of the most talented. Um, and so I'm so excited to introduce her, her to you today. So I'm going to share a little bit about who Farnoosh is and then turn it over to her. So Farnoosh is one of America's leading personal finance authorities hooked on helping Americans live their richest, happiest lives. From her earliest days reporting for Money Magazine to hosting a primetime series on CNBC and becoming the resident money guru for Oh! The Oprah Magazine, she's become one of America's favorite go-to money experts. Millions of Americans also tune into her award-winning podcast, So Money, where she chats with leading experts, authors, and influencers about their financial perspectives, failures, and habits. She's a sought-after speaker and the best-selling author of multiple books, her latest entitled When She Makes More, 10 Rules for Breadwinning Women. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband and two adorable children, and we're so excited to have her here today. Welcome, Farnoosh. Thank you, Emily. And if I am, in fact, the funniest person you know, you need to get out more. <laughs> you are hilarious, and I'm sure that's going to become apparent. And I think your gift for storytelling and the experiences that you've been through um, are just, you know, it's incredible what you've experienced in your life and in your career thus, thus far. And so I'm excited to have you share all of that with the audience today. Well, I hurt my life. <laughs> coincidence that I'm on this podcast and I just said that? No. No. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that. So everyone has what one of my um, experts called their I Heart My Life story. So take us back. I know you're going to share where you are today, but give us a little bit of the background and what helped you get to this point. Oh, gosh. <laughs> a lot of stamina and hard work and drive, but I think that it would be an incomplete story if I didn't really share how I grew up and the fact that my parents are immigrants from the Middle East coming to America. Like a lot of successful people, you know, coming from a lack of resources as a young person is a, is, is a benefit, I think. You know, we uh, I didn't grow up with a lot of uh, wealth, uh, working class parents. Um, in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is a working class city in America, still is. Grew up in a hugely diverse community, single parents, um, you know, uh, kids of all different colors and races and religions. And so in some ways, for me, being the woman, the girl with the weird name with the Iranian parents, I totally, you know, I, I, I was one of many. And but that said, I think that throughout my childhood, I, I faced various levels of adversity nothing crazy and tragic, but you know, we moved around a lot. And I think I always had to be like the new girl. And with that comes a certain level of bravery, right? Trying to sort of introduce yourself at a young age. Kids can be really cruel, um, trying to find your way of fitting in. I think that that experience was hugely defining for me. And it kind of gave me the personality that I have as an adult. Um, you have to be a really good observer of your environment um, because in order to find where you're going to plug yourself in, you have to kind of learn the lay of the land and become a really good leader of people. And that I take with me into my career, into my life. Um, you have to be brave, you have to be courageous, you have to be the one who has to suck it up. And you know, when the teacher's doing roll call and you're the, you're the new girl or the new guy and you even have a, re a weird name like I do, it's hard to not stick out like a sore thumb sometimes and I had to just sort of like learn how to roll with that and maybe that's part of where my humor comes because part of my humor is probably rooted in uh, being an insecure kid and trying to find like ways for people to like me and uh, I have over the years massaged that hopefully it, it's just become like a part of you know just aspect of me and not you know an uncomfortable thing that people have to go through when they know me like oh here she goes trying to crack a joke but no, it's amazing. But I can hear what you're saying. I really appreciate my, my childhood. Didn't at the time. Hated being the new girl. Hated having the weird name. Hated having the parents who didn't really speak English that well. 
because the ki other kids didn't understand. And all you want as a young kid is to be understood and accepted. And you later learn as an adult, like, it's cool to be different. It's cool to be unique. And it's great to have the skill sets to learn how to navigate any environment, even especially with your the different one. Yeah, I can see that. And I love that you're sharing that part of yourself, that girl who had the weird name, who you know was standing out, but not for the reasons that you wanted. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. So when you were growing up, I imagine you had some sort of vision of the future and something that you wanted to do. What did that vision look like? I knew that I wanted to be in front of an audience. And in high school and middle school, that meant doing theater. And I thought that that was my path. I thought that, you know, I got a lot of, I, I felt my most true, truest self when I was performing or if I was conveying something to an audience, whether that was a speech in English class or it was a, a, a soliloquy from Macbeth or, or, or reading the newscast, which I did later in my life. And I think that that presentation aspect of, of work and, I just liked that a lot. And for me, the, the future was you know, being in front of some sort of audience, sharing something really compelling, interesting, maybe even life changing, and being sort of a, a considered to be kind of a, an expert, uh, someone you, you refer to for some kind of help. I really wanted to help people. And so that morphed into all sorts of me experiments. It was theater, then it was well, maybe I want to be a journalist because that's a totally service-driven career. And now I think I've combined those two skill sets, right? The sort of performance theater and then the journalism, the service into being kind of this go-to money expert. The money, the money quotient kind of arrived. Um, I don't want to say it was like, always my goal to be a financial expert. I don't think anyone grows up thinking that. Um, if they do, they're exceptional. Uh, but maybe, for me, maybe I think Susie Orman. Well, maybe, yeah, Susie. But I think even, yeah, perhaps. Uh, but for me, I think because, again, going back to my roots, my, my parents are Middle Eastern, money was not a taboo topic in our household. But it is a lot of, in a lot of other households. I don't think we were the normal family that talked about mortgages and layoffs at the dinner table. Um, we didn't talk about sports, so we talked about mortgages and layoffs. <laughs> and so I think I grew up with this fluency and, and relative ease talking about money and that when I got to decide, when I had to decide what my journalism path was going to look like and it's important to have a niche, I chose money and, per, and personal finance and it stuck. So one of my favorite stories is you basically seizing the day and taking an opportunity to, I think it was to be on the Today Show, just like a short, short segment. Um, you filled in for someone else. I don't know if I'm remembering it correctly, but I'd love to hear a little bit about how you went from journalism, having this degree to starting to land some amazing job opportunities and how things started to morph into where you are now. So take us back to that place. Sure. So, um, it, it is true that I got on the Today Show. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't like because someone was, uh, you know, slept through their alarm or anything like that. But I will say that what led to that opportunity was me really um, getting outside my comfort zone. A lot of the things that I teach, you know, it's important in order to like find your success or find your fulfillment. You can't do it alone. You have to get outside of your comfort zone. You have to also leave a good track record, right? You have to. Every relationship, every experience you have, make it a positive one because it all does build up to the moment where you feel like you've arrived. And going back years before I got, land, I landed a, a segment on the Today Show, which by the way, was when my life really in some ways changed for the better. That was an incredible exposure. But I was hustling as a journalist, working a, a desk job. I was a correspondent here. I was a reporter there, a producer here. And happy, but not exuberant. You know, I was like, I'm, I know I'm doing the right things, but I wasn't, the right things weren't happening fast enough for me. I was super aggressive. I wanted to just kind of like, maybe I wasn't being impatient, but I wanted a, a life where I felt more in control of my destiny as opposed to waiting for my boss to tell me what news assignments to take and whether I would get that raise. I wanted to be in more control of my finances and more control of my career fate. So I decided to write a book 
and the book was going to be about personal finance for young adults, something that I felt very, uh, very qualified to write about. I was working as a financial journalist. I myself was in my 20s trying to piece it together financially in New York, somehow making it work. I think I had a few tidbits of advice to share, plus I could also research the heck out of this book as a journalist. So I wrote this book and I I didn't know how the first thing about how to get published, but I knew that I had people within my ecosystem that were authors, so let's start there. How did you get published? Who's your literary agent? What do I have to do? And slowly but surely got to connect the dots on my own some amazing people opened doors for me, introduced me to their literary agents, their publishers. Fast forward, I've got this book that published in 2008. The book's called, first book, Lit, uh, You're So Money, Live Rich Even When You're Not. And, you know, we send it out to all the different places to get some features, some mentions, and the Today Show calls. Now, that is not a coincidence. It wasn't just because my book landed on the desk and the producer thought it was cute. This producer remembered me from years and years prior when I was a lowly intern at a magazine and I had to sometimes facilitate uh, segments for her based on some of the content in our magazine. So a lot of times the Today Show pulls segments, they create segments from print work. And I was the lowly intern that you know was at my desk till 11 p.m. and Patricia was the producer at the Today Show who was leaning on me to help her get everything perfected for the morning she looks at this book and she's like farnoosh and the rest is history now even then i wasn't guaranteed a segment um she liked me she knew me so that helped but she then asked me for my reel she wanted to see me in a live interview situation and then i just like i was like i'll get that for you sure i didn't have anything so i hustled together some live stuff and i you know because i'd worked in tv i had some things and just to show that I could not choke on live television. Yeah, um, I think that's what I'm thinking of. You had yeah. to do a segment. I remember you were sitting in the back of the taxi. They told you what to say. You memorized it really quickly. You'd never oh, done that before. Okay. So that was, again, so that was even before the Today Show. I was, the, when I was a lowly intern at that magazine, the publicist for the magazine came into the newsroom at around 10 a.m. and said, does anybody want to go on CNN and talk about our new issue? Anyone? <laughs> Crickets. And I said, well, you know, I have a master's in broadcast. Uh, I've done some school live shots. Like, I'll just figure this out. So you got to fake it till you make it. So I raised my hand and said, I'll do it. She goes, great. You know, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, pray that you don't choke on, ta on camera. But here's the press release. Here's the magazine. It's a four-minute segment. Don't screw up. So I went in the cab, read this this. this you know, this press release probably a thousand times, repeated it back to myself, got some sound bites in my head ready, and slapped on some makeup, and I was live on CNN at 20 years old. And I just remember thinking, it's just three minutes, maybe four, like what's the worst that can happen? Just speak clearly, smile, and if you don't know something, don't pretend you know it. Just be like, you know, that's a good question. Uh, we're not sure, but here's something else I can talk about. Like, that's a trick to TV. When you get a, a question that you have no idea how to answer, you just smile and nod and go, that's an excellent question. But you know what's even more interesting? <laughs> Transition. So I love that story. And I'm so glad that we figured out which one it was because I know you told me yeah. a lot of amazing stories. A lot stories. of stories. Yeah. And Life's because just a bunch of stories, right? You are. You're full of them. And I think it's so important for all the I Heart My Lifers listening just to hear how you move forward despite never having done that and not necessarily maybe knowing how to. You, you pieced it together. You took action when no one else volunteered. And then years later, when you needed that reel, you had at least a little bit of footage to put in there, correct? Correct. Yeah. So then when the Today Show called, you put something together, you pitched them, and then they did end up having you on. And I was so nervous the night before. I almost threw up. I know that I cut myself shaving my legs. To this day, I have the mark, which I think is kind of special. You know, it's my Today Show, night before the show, jitters, scar on my left leg from uh, nervously shaving my legs. Uh, so is that, too, is that too much information? I love for it. It's a great That's story. 
Yeah, I was so nervous. I remember Meredith Vieira interviewed me about my book. And I will say this to your audience too, you know, even once I got booked, the next hurdle was, okay, what are you going to talk about? I mean, we're going to talk about the book, but how are you going to make it special? How are you going to make it visual? Because the Today Show and every television broadcast, they're going to be asking, well, why is this necessarily a TV segment and not just a magazine article, right? So how do you bring this concept of millennials and money and, and their financial strappedness to life? So I said, well, we have a couple of months before the segment. How about if I, and I'm going to be taking some trips to different cities. I was going to Philly and Chicago and San Francisco. How about if I take my camera and interview young people on the street about why they are, quote unquote, so money. The book was called You're So Money. And we got great footage, you know, like, I'm so money because I'm living with my best friend and we're splitting rent and we're able to be able, we're able to save, or I'm so money because... I just got the best job or I'm so money because I'm going back to grad school and I'm investing in my future. And you know, the whole premise of my book was to cast a light, a, 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 a bright light on young people. Whereas the, the traditional kind of like the stories that were surrounding around millennials and money, let's just say they weren't very uplifting. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to be uplifting. I wanted to be encouraging and say, you know what? It's, it's a hard, time to be young and you're not making a lot of money, but here's how some people are making the best of things. And so that those clips of people talk about why they're so money was sort of the opener to our interview. And it kind of set the stage like, you know, one young woman is, is busting the myth that being a young person doesn't uh, means that you're necessarily broke or financially broke. And they showed these clips and then they brought me to the, to the segment with, with Meredith and it went well despite the fact that I more or less called her old oh, and no. she told me that she, well, yeah, Tell she told more. me, she said, why, she said, why did, why do you think you're the right voice for this generation and not necessarily like, you know, um, someone older. And I said, well, we don't want necessarily someone like you. Oh boy. I did. I did one of these on live air and, <sighs> hand over mouth. And she goes, I ought to slap you. <laughs> Great TV. And when I was done, I was certain they were never going to have me back. But then my producer came up to me and said, that was great television. And we would love to have you back. So sometimes even when you screw up and you think it's over, it's over. <laughs> All that. And I just said the wrong thing. I had an out of body experience. She said, no, it was great. As long as you just kind of smile and nod and and laugh at your mistakes. You know, I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. What did I just say? You know, and everybody was laughing and it was, it was great. I love so much about what you just shared. And um, one of the things that I've learned from you is to make things as easy as possible for people. And that's exactly yeah. what you did there. They didn't know what the segment was going to be about. So you came up with the whole thing and did it and made it happen. Yeah, you have to, as I say, put it on a silver platter for them. Don't give them any reasons to say no or say, oh, how are we going to really do this? Make it seem easy for them. Do the hard work so that it becomes easy for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and that I do to this day. I, a lot of times, still get the producers. You think the producer, and the producers are, here's the thing, producers are very busy. That producer who was working on my segment was probably working on a dozen other things. So to her credit, I don't want to sound like, you know, they're not, they're just twiddling their thumbs and looking for the guests to come up with the content. No, in fact, you know, they were, they had the intuition to know that they should book you. They, they went after you, they found the segment, they got the general idea, but now you have to show up for that. Yeah. And I think that's only fair. You've been given this great opportunity. Don't screw it up. And also it gives you the opportunity to make it your own. And if they're asking you what you want to talk about, that's great because now you can control it to some extent. You know, I, well, what do you want to talk about? What are you best at talking about? What, what play to your strengths? Yeah. I love that way of thinking about it. Okay. So after the break, I want to talk about what happened after the today show and how you've been able to create a brand from this amazing book and write another book and launch the podcast. So let's dive into that after yeah. the break. 
All right, everyone, it's Emily Williams here with Farnoosh Tarabi. And before the break, we were talking about Farnoosh's experience on the Today Show and everything that had to happen before that experience for her to land that opportunity. And now I want to cover what happened next because Farnoosh has an incredible award-winning podcast. She's now written her second book, and she has an amazing brand that's helping other people figure out how to take their own book and turn it into a brand. So, Farnoosh, tell us what happened after the Today Show experience. Thanks, Emily. All right. So, after the Today Show, which was really a product, a byproduct of writing that first book, was that I got tons more media coverage. I, I started to become a regular on the Today Show. I landed a television program where I was one of many experts on the series. Gosh, I got branding opportunities all from that exposure, which again was thanks to writing a a book that hopefully was making an impact. And I think that throughout my, and that was 10 years ago. And since that time, I've made it my job, my responsibility to always be putting out new and irreverent work in some format. Some years it's books, other years it's a podcast, other years it's a television show, web show, you know, always finding a way to add value to the existing conversations out there about money and to put your own spin on it. And so I wrote that first book and it did very well and it helped catapult my career. But I knew that that momentum was going to die out unless I continued to find ways to stay out there, stay relevant, stay important and give back. And that's a running thought in my head, you know, so it's a new year. What's going to be my, my project this year or my big contribution this year. And I think as experts and your audience listening, that's for me, it's been a really great way to stay relevant and it's a bit of pressure on yourself to feel like you have, no one's telling me I have to do this, but it's what I have decided has worked for me. I think the books have been the most, most moving sort of bodies of work that I have put out there in terms of connecting with people, finding new new communities, finding new opportunities. But I also think the podcast, just because of where we are in the world, people are tired. Now, they're not tired of consuming books, but I think that if you are someone who has put out several books and, and you want to continue that, that's fine. But what else can you do? That's a little more dynamic. That could, that could maybe help you connect with your audience more regularly. And that's what I wanted to do at this stage in my life. I wanted to find a way to, I wanted to figure out the internet a little bit. I had a website, I wasn't blogging. I wanted to leverage the virtual community better. And the podcast has been the probably the best decision I have made um, in the last three to five years of my career. Since launching my last book, this was sort of the next baby. How and many episodes have you done so far? Over 600. Wow. And Any favorite guests? Oh my gosh, Emily Williams, oh, yeah. for <laughs> sure. I think that I've had a lot of famous people on the show. That's always fun because you think you know them. You know, you think you know them. They've, you've seen, you've read everything, you've, you've, you've watched them. But when they start talking about money, it opens up a whole new perspective. For example, with Tim Gunn from Project Runway, who's one of my favorite humans on the planet, just because uh, I think he's so endearing, so yes. charming, lovely, kind. I actually had the opera. I lived in the same building with him for a couple of years wow. by chance. Wow. I, I went to, the, to see this rental. And as I was leaving, I opened the elevator door opens and it's Tim Gunn. And I'm like, well, where do I sign to live here? <laughs> that was my deciding factor was that Tim Gunn was there and that I might be able to see him on occasion. But, you know, he revealed on my podcast that for the first two seasons of Project Runway, which, you know, went on to win Emmys and just season after season, he didn't get paid. And it was because he didn't ask to get paid. It wasn't because they didn't pay people. I'm pretty sure Heidi Klum got a paycheck. But he didn't know the industry. He was an academic. He was a, you know, he ran the fashion school and came to reality TV with not really any mentorship and didn't know like what was to be expected. He thought, well, I'm just playing myself. But oh isn't my your goodness. Isn't your expertise for something? You know, he just wasn't thinking in those ways. Now it's 
it would it be I mean, also it was like years ago. So it was not, nobody was talking about how much reality TV people were making. And right. It wasn't until he went to an event where he was emceeing and, uh, someone in the audience was a talent agent and was like, Oh, Tim, I love your work. Who represents you? And he's thinking, I don't even know what that means. And this agent said, let's talk on Monday. And since then, he's been happily compensated and has other opportunities. So that again, you know, and also he calls himself a financial late bloomer. He was 50 when he got the gig at Project Runway. And up until then, he had debt. He was living in a rental. And wow, I can't wait so to listen to that one. It's really, really sweet. And uh He's just, I, he really opened up on the show. Like, I don't think he's ever shared this stuff with an audience. And I really appreciated that. But then we also have people you've never heard of who deserve a spotlight. People who have gotten themselves out of massive, massive amounts of debt. I just had a couple on the show, doctors, me and Renee Darko, a couple. They're doctors, but they're also, they also have their MBAs, their parents. They had $662,000 in debt when they graduated. Wow. All of the debt, and they paid it off in three years. Wow. It's obvious how much this work really means to you, Farnoosh. Thank you. I get so excited talking about the, I call them these financial warriors, you know, or we're, we all have great stories. We may not think that we're the best with money or that, um, you know, we're smart when it comes to finances. And I think that that's just stories we tell ourselves that we're all able to master our money. And even if you have had a a, a, a tough time with it, whether it's you had a tough time earning it or saving it or getting out of debt. Certainly along the way, you had some wins. So let's yeah. focus on that. You know, you may, you might have made a few good decisions along the way or some good thoughts that you had. Let's excavate those and bring those to the forefront. Because if you just, as you know, if you just focus on the negative, you'll never see the, the light of day. Exactly. And so speaking of focusing on wins, you launched the podcast. So tell us a little bit about how the Oprah opportunity came to be. You're now a contributor for Oh, the Oprah magazine, which yeah. is massive. So tell us a little bit about how that happened. Oh my gosh. The couple months before I got the email from Oprah, well, not Oprah, Oprah, but you know, her team, <laughs> that sounds hilarious. Sounds amazing. Oprah's not emailing anybody. <laughs> At my level. I remember you uh -huh. saying that. You're like, you don't go to Oprah. <laughs> yeah, Oprah does. You don't. Yeah. It's just it's just one of those things that really, truly has to manifest after years of doing the good work and having no expectations. I, just, I never, ever imagined being someone who would write for Oprah magazine. I loved I dreamt about like being on the Oprah Winfrey show or you know, but those are all dreams. We all have those dreams. I had a dream two months before I got the email about this potential opportunity that Oprah and I were having brunch. This, this is a true story. <laughs> I, think I, should start, I should start being more in tune to my dreams, but yeah. she, she and I were having a brunch. There were pancakes and we we're having such a great time. And in my dream, I remember thinking, I don't want to, I don't want to pitch myself too hard in this, in this, during this breakfast. Like I'm just going to like enjoy being with Oprah and I'm not going to mention that I have a book. But like for her to like put it in the book club or anything like that. Um, but I left the brunch not even mentioning at all that I was an author and kicking myself in my dream. And then I wake up a couple months later to this email that was basically like, hey, Farnoosh, we're the editors at Oprah Magazine. We love your stuff. Would you ever um, have you ever considered writing? Would you ever consider writing for us? I was like, would I ever consider breathing air? Yeah, <laughs> I would. This is, this is not even a, like, what? So I wrote back right away and I said, absolutely. Thank you. And you know, up until that point, I had written for a lot of other places, Glamour, Marie Claire, the New York Times. Like, so I, I think she found me because of my body of work and editors talk to other editors. And you know, it's like one of those things where, again, you have to stay relevant and you have to stay busy for people to be able to find you and for opportunities to present themselves. You can't just sit on your couch and rest on your laurels from one big win. You gotta keep on churning it out. So she knew of me and it was I was it was a competitive thing, as you can imagine. They had not just reached out to me, but several other financial writers and experts. And I was one of the last to get an interview in person with the editor in chief and Gail King and there was a team of people. 
And I tell you what, I think that what ultimately got me the position was maybe something that you said earlier, which was like, you can tell I, I'm obsessed with personal finance and these stories of people who thrive despite adversity and make get over all their money challenges and just are exceptional role models when it comes to money. And I am prolific. I am a self starter. They loved that I had this podcast because I think it to them, it indicated a few things. It indicated that Farnoosh is a go getter. You know, she doesn't just wait for opportunities. I didn't wait for someone to say, Hey, do you want to host a podcast? I was like, I'm going to do this. I have no idea if it's going to lead me to anywhere, but I'm passionate about this. I believe in this. And I've been doing this personal finance thing for long enough to know that this might, you know, this might hit a nerve with, <laughs> with the listening population. And I think that they also recognize that through my work as a podcast host, the fact that it was at the time every day, that I was a content hub. Like, you wanna yeah. know what's happening in the world of personal finance? I can tell you, because I've interviewed 30 people this month about it, and I've also been receiving questions from people all month, all year, and all day, and that I answer on the Friday episode. So I am, I am in it, you know, and you don't have to, it's no guesswork for me. I know how people feel about money. I know especially what women think about money, which is important for their audience. And so that really excited them. You know, they thought, okay, we're going to team up with somebody who's not just waiting to be handed a story. She is going to be able to tell us what is important and what people are thinking about and what we should be thinking about. And, and it was obvious how committed you are, like hundreds of episodes. Clearly, this is a topic that you can write about month after month. Yes. And absolutely. And it has been. It's been, you know, I, I do interviews and then Oprah.com will run excerpts from those interviews sometimes and allow my guests to get more exposure. Um, they really appreciate that. And these days, you know, it's all about finding good content. You can't have enough content. People are consuming content at rates they've we've never been before. You become very fast readers. And so it's, it's when you can partner with somebody who can deliver that, I think that's a total win-win. And I, I like to think that that is what, and I think they also just liked me, let's be honest. I mean, I, like, yeah, I like, I hope I didn't, I didn't call anyone old in the room. I learned <laughs> that my first interview with Mary Vieira. And, you know, at the end of the interview, it wasn't even an interview. I felt like it was just a conversation. We were all so engaged in talking about money and women. And, and uh, I lost my voice the next day, legit. I like woke up, had no voice, never happened to me before in my life. Wow. And uh, I had to go get on medication and it was a whole to do. But I was like, well, at least I lost my voice today and not yesterday. But I think that was why I lost my voice because we sat there and talked for two hours. Yeah. Maybe there are some underlying spiritual reasons as well, but that can be another another episode. I mean, I totally get it. So my fear, I have this dream. I guess it's a nightmare that Oprah is going to die before I get on Super Soul Sunday. And oh. it's like my worst fear. Um, and so I get that. And I think it's just so amazing, again, where your career started um, and every little piece of the puzzle has contributed to you getting here and you followed your instincts and this idea of reinvention and continuing to go to that next level or to try something new or to do it in a different way. Um, that's so, so powerful. And I know that a lot of driven women are listening and to give yourself permission to try these different ways of doing it though is not always what I see. I see people like trying the same thing over and over again. It's like, well, this has worked, so I need to keep doing it. But I love how you're just doing it in, in different ways. Where do you think that comes from? Ooh, I think, oh gosh, I don't know. I've always been a multitasker, like on crack. You know, I just, in high school, I did it all. And one of my teachers actually said to me, she's like, why do you do so much? Like, what are you doing this for? You know, yeah, you can just, what is your motivation? She's like, you know, you can just quit the school paper. Cause every <laughs> month I had this, I had to edit the school paper and then lay it out. I had no help. I had a co-editor in chief, a guy who was a waste of space. <laughs> and it was always this labor of pain, but also love. And she's like, what are you doing it for? Just quit. And I said, I can't, I just can't. It's something in me. I can, I'm not a quitter. Um, I know my limits. I've learned my limits. I know when to say no, 
But once I start something, it's really hard for me to abandon it. I have to finish it. And even if it pains me, um, but I think I always, I think it's the entrepreneurial spirit in me. I think all entrepreneurs feel rest. There's a restlessness inside of me that I feel like I always, and I'll, I'm, I'm so blessed. I've, I've actually found what I love to do. So I don't look at it as work, work, work. It's, it's work, but it's not like, Oh, work, right. You know, yeah, I get it. it's, it's a, it's a, it's a it's work that I love to do. It's a pleasure. Mm. Yeah, I can feel that. And in terms of um, the brand that you're starting to create, I want to pick up there after this break because it's kind of a yet another avenue where you're going to contribute to other people who maybe have their own book and want to turn it into a brand. So I want to pick up there in just a second. All right, everyone, it's Emily Williams, the host of the I Heart My Life show, and we're here with Farnoosh Tarabi. And before the break, we were talking all about the podcast and how Farnoosh is a contributor to Oh! The Oprah Magazine, which is amazing. And she now has taken her 15 years of experience, and she's going to help other people create their own brand from the work that they've already done with books and you know other things that have been really influential and help them turn that into an actual brand. So Farnoosh, will you tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing there? Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited about my live workshop that I developed mainly because people were asking me to do it. I noticed that over the last couple of years, especially as I was traveling the country and doing events or even through my podcast, a big question I was getting over and over again was, Farnoosh, how did you become you? Like, really? I mean, we get it. You love money and you're into personal finance, but you've built quite a brand and you, you're very busy and you seem to be happy too, which is another thing that we can't figure out. <laughs> and and I said, well, and I had to think about it. I said, well, I don't know. I just, I worked hard and it paid off. But we know that's not true, right? There are systems, there are best practices, there are certain projects that, that really kicked it off. And we talked about it a lot on the, on the episode already, but for me, writing books has been a huge way to advance my career and to really understand and establish my brand. And even going back to that very first book, especially back to that very first book. So when I do meet entrepreneurs and subject matter experts who want to kind of get out there more, they want to get in front of an audience. They want to connect more deeply with people. They want to feel more fulfilled in their work. I always say, have you written a book? And, I'll, and if they say no, I'll say, well, I can help you. I can help you. I can help you connect the dots. Uh, I, I like to work with entrepreneurs who have already some track record. They're not newbies. They have a business. They are thriving in that business maybe they have a little too much going on and they want to kind of prioritize and they do have always wanted to write a book, but just never felt they had the right resources or the plan of action or they didn't, didn't, didn't know people. And so what the workshop does is it plugs you into all of the best practices and the people who can help to make your book a reality. And we're not talking some random self-published book that sits on Amazon that nobody ever notices. Uh, that's It's a high ticket workshop. So we want you to get a high ticket value out of the workshop. We want you to walk out with the most important connections. People that I have met over the last 15 years of my life, I bring to you on a silver platter in two days. People who are excited to meet you, learn your idea, help you with your book, help you with the marketing of the book. And so it's a small group of eight to 10 entrepreneurs we're currently enrolling some folks for the May workshop, which is May 10th and 11th in New York, two full days. You can learn more about it at booktobrand.co, C-O, no M, um, booktobrand.co. You can learn more about why I started this, who it's for, what it, how it's designed, and how to apply. And, you know, again, it's super high touch. What my students often say is that the where the value really pays off is in the relationships, right? So this could be an online course somewhere and there are courses out there that talk about how to write a book, but this also focuses on how to write the best book, get it in the best hands 
so that you can reap the best repercussions, right? The mo like brand opportunities, TV deals, TV segments, magazine uh, mentions, speaking opportunities, how to leverage that book, right? That's what I have done very well in my career. If I've done nothing right, I have been able to leverage books. I don't, I don't make New York Times bestseller lists. I'll be the first to admit. And if you are looking for someone, if you are looking just to get on the New York Times list, don't come to the workshop, right? If you're looking to write an important book that's gonna change lives, it's gonna change your life, then we should talk. But if you're looking for sort of a get on the bestseller quick scheme, there are other programs that do that. It's not where I thrive in tech teaching people how to do that. I hope that that's just a byproduct of, of working with me, but it's not kind of the centerpiece of the program. I do turn away people who kind of um, mention that at the get go. And I'm like, well, I think we have different goals. Uh, so, but if you are looking to create a, an important body of work through a book, get it in a lot of hands, publish it with a big publisher, maybe create a career as an author in addition to your career as an expert, as an entrepreneur, then we should definitely talk because I tell you, I've written three books and it's been quite the journey and I want to give back. I want to like, what am I going to, what am I doing sitting with all this information? I, I love that. Give it back. Yeah. You know, and forward. I love this whole concept because for me, it just showcases this idea of possibility because I I've written a book. I haven't published it yet. The, the big book. Um, I have an ebook that's a 90 pager that, um, I love as well, but I have lots of dreams in terms of writing and contributing in that way. And so many people are like, well, just self publish, do whatever's easy at first, especially, you know, for the first piece that, um, you put out there. But this for me is like possibility to connect with amazing people, to learn from you right away and to really like take this to the top much quicker than people probably expect is possible. Is that true? It's a hundred percent true. And I'm not, I'm not poo pooing, uh, self publishing. I think that that's even something that I might consider at one point. Cause it is, like you said, it's a faster way to get to the market. Yeah. So a self published book could help you build your email list. It could help you in a lot of ways. And, and now there are hybrid publishers where you can, have a little bit more control over the writing and editing process, but what you get from the hybrid publisher is the distribution platforms. Again, really important when you're trying to get your book in a lot of hands. So I think that every process has its pros and cons. Traditional publisher takes years before they publish your book. So if you're on a slower schedule, you know, then you'll be happy. But what I do is I just sort of listen to everybody who's applying. What are the goals? If there are some people who want to, self-publish or do hybrid publishing, we can work with you. We can, I can bring in the best people who work with self-publishers uh, to help to, 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 to teach, you, teach you how to do it. Like other self-publishers who've done it recently, what worked, what didn't, um, so that you can still get a lot of value out of the two days. Yeah, I think a lot of the people listening are like me where, you know, they want the biggest and they want the best deal. You just and they want the it. stars? Yes. I feel that. Yeah. I know all about that. So uh, either way, though, um, if you are interested in writing a book to reach more people, become a go-to expert in your field, people know your name, not just your you know, your mom yeah. and your spouse, but like people at big level, like the editor of Oprah Magazine goes, oh, I know that person. I should give her a call. Mm. You know, and you want to come to this workshop. Love it. So what's in store for you that you're really excited about? So we have the workshop. What else is going on in the world of Farnoosh? Oh, gosh. Well, I haven't abandoned my TV life. You know, I've always, every every so often, I try to hack it away at the TV world. I uh, try to, I've had success with some TV shows that have been short-lived, you know, one season, two seasons, straight to DVD. No, um, <laughs> but I am obsessed with, as I said, you know, from the very beginning, I love sort of the performance aspect of what I do and trying to talk about money in a entertaining way, in a kind of service-driven entertaining way. And TV has been a great partner in my career as I've been trying to build my brand. And I know that I'm very comfortable in front of the camera and it's been something that I've just, I've been doing, I've been fortunate. I hosted a CNBC show a couple of years ago. Before that I was at an ABC show. Before that I was with TLC and 
uh, things are stirring again this year. There is some interest in doing some work with me. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like, but uh, I'm, I don't say no to TV opportunities, even though when they don't pay, I just love it. And I know that, again, I know how to leverage it. I know that when you're on TV, even though no one's really watching TV anymore, we're watching our phones or watching our, um, our laptops, but I think there's a lot of power still in doing work through broadcast medium, which by the way, they can make into little videos online and, and social media bites. And so they're with it. They know how to like get to the audience. But I, I feel like it's a longer game though, TV. You know, it's one of those things where sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes you have to just try a few times to try to find, uh, it's a, there are a lot of things that have to align. You know, the audience, the production, the host, the talent, the timing, the time slot, you know, all of that has to really just click. And my job is just to continue to have a good skincare regimen and dye my hair so I never look my age and then get my TV job. One <laughs> and be funny and amazing and <laughs> contribute great content. Emily, I'm not kidding. That's really all it takes. <laughs> okay, good to know. Oil of Olay. And a little boat. I feel like I gotta get Botox here. <laughs> and then, um, and then and I'll see set. you in, on the screen. So I want to ask you a little bit about mindset. So we haven't specifically talked about that, but a lot of my work with my clients includes mindset work. So really transforming your thoughts to be more successful. So you mentioned never saying no to TV. We for have me. your story. We have your story about CNN and really just going for it despite not maybe feeling ready, right? We have tons of examples of the ways in which you've never given up and you've leveraged every opportunity, which takes bravery. It takes putting yourself out there. So what other, I guess, mindset work or ways of thinking do you feel has contributed to your success? Well, I will share that more recently I had a breakthrough that I didn't even realize I needed to have this breakthrough, but I was on the phone with a colleague of mine, Barbara Stanny, who's this phenomenal female empowerment coach. She focuses on women and wealth. And I was having her on my podcast, but I was also just chatting with her because she's amazing. And we have coffee from time to time. And, you know, she, her story is, in, is so inspirational. I won't get into it too much, but, you know, she is firmly of, of the mindset that women, all women can earn more than they're earning and should earn more than they're earning. She, I have borrowed a phrase, a saying from her that I now use all the time. And that is that when women make more, the world becomes a better place. If you believe this, then anything in your head that's saying, well, I don't need to make more money. You know, I'm making enough. Life is good. I should be grateful. I think that's a very feminine way of thinking, you know? And that was your way of thinking, right, at one point? And that was my way of thinking. I felt, every year I was like, I can't get better, any better than this. I mean, I should just be happy. I should save my money because next year is not gonna be as good as this year. How could it possibly be? I almost felt oddly out of control of my ability to earn, even though year after year I was proving to myself that I could earn more than last year. and. I would hear about other entrepreneurs making seven figures, eight figures. And I was like, well, that's never going to be me. And I think because part of me, and if I'm being totally honest, felt that if I became the person who wanted to make more money, that I was become, I was going to be unliked, that I was going to be someone who would be seen as having her priorities screwed up. Well, if you make more money, if that's your goal, then there has to necessarily be some time associated with that. And that'll be time away from your husband and your family and your and your children. And I, what kind of a person are you? And these are the stupid voices in my head. No one is telling me this, you know. No but one where is. Where does that come from? Does it is it a family? Is it generational belief? I think that I, you know, I'm no one. It's no secret. I'm the breadwinner in my marriage. I've written a book about it. And I think that part of why I wanted to write the book was because I had insecurities around being the breadwinner and I wanted to explore those insecurities because I did feel that it, society was judging me. I felt that my mother, this is a fact, and I wrote about it, and we're, we're cool, mom, mom and I are still friends, but she, you know, she was very skeptical of how could Farnoosh be the breadwinner and still be at the forefront of running her family and you know, tucking her kids at, at night 
at home, you know, and it's like, I'll figure it out. Okay. And this is good for all of us. The fact that I make more because it's what I want to do. My husband's okay with it. Our kids are thriving, you know, but there's a lot of skepticism that comes with women who make any money, who work, who have children. There's this feeling that you can't have it all. You're going to fail. And while even my most intelligent, most intelligent side of my brain was saying that's all BS and I shouldn't buy into any of that hysteria. I think that my, you know, my primitive brain, the primitive side of my brain, the one that's like with the caveman era, the, the banging, I was like, Oh no, this can't work out. You know, this can't possibly work out. And I've yet to ever meet a man who says to himself, I shouldn't really earn any more money. It's enough, you know, no, it's, it's, a, it's a warped mindset. And I think that what Barbara again reminded me is that if you do feel complacent in your life as an earner, you're like, oh, I have enough where we can take vacations. We can eat out occasionally. Like we're paying our mortgage. We're not stressed. Take yourself out of the equation. Your money is not just about you. Your money is a, is, is a resource, is a tool to give back, to be charitable to improve the lives of your extended family. If you don't want to, if you don't want the money, but you're making it, well then give it away. You know, there's a lot you can do with this money. You can, you can be an agent of change. Money isn't everything. Money doesn't buy happiness, but by God it does buy resources and infrastructure and people, people's time. You know, you can make an impact. You really can, you can build schools, you can do whatever you want. And so, and the thing is that when women make more, when they did a survey and they found that women are more charitable than men in, in all income levels, in all kinds of households, women are more charitable than men as a, as a percentage of their incomes. And so that again, reminded me that as a woman, again, I, I'm a giver, I want to give back. And if it's not even, if it's not about me, then it's got to be about other people. And I want to now earn more to leave a legacy. It's not just about being able to buy more things or go to nicer dinners or buy another purse. It's about leaving a legacy. What does all this work for if I can't leave this planet with someone saying, wow, what an impact she made. And your money can make an impact. It absolutely can. I love that. Super inspirational. And how would you say that things have shifted since you adopted that mindset? I've doubled my income. And I'm Bam. Forward. Yeah. I, I had this epiphany when I was pregnant with my first son and... Now he's three and a half, and I have more than doubled my income since those years. Now, I've, I'm writing an article about this for Money Magazine about how becoming a mom has made me richer. Um, I don't even go into this mindset shift necessarily, but there is something that goes off when you become a parent. A lot of things go off. You know, your your sense, of your instincts to provide and protect um, explode. And I think as the, as the existing breadwinner, I felt an even greater responsibility to um, provide for my family, but I wanted to do it in a way that made sense for all of us, right? It didn't mean that I was going to work double my shifts. It meant that I had to work smarter. I had to learn how to scale. I learned how, learned how to say no to certain opportunities that were not worth my time, to leave room for other opportunities that would be. And so there's a piece that I'm writing about that coming out soon, but it really all kind of um, clicked when I had that conversation with Barbara and I also was a, a mom to be, and I was like, yeah, this is my time. I got, if I don't get in, if I don't, if I keep playing small, no one's going to win. Hmm. I want everyone to listen to that. If I keep playing small, no one's going to win. And I think that we think that wanting to make a lot of money, it's going to be seen as selfish or people won't like us, like you said. But so much about us making money is not about us. It's about the legacy. It's about the movement. It's about the impact. And it's so important to remember. So the final question I want to ask you that I ask all my guests is how do you feel you've been able to create a life that's better than your dreams? How? Ooh, hmm. I have found the right partner in life. You know, I think I've been really fortunate. You have an amazing husband, Emily. I mean, I think that for those of us who are able to find strong and mutual partnerships in life, it's everything. It is everything. You know, my book, 
when she makes more was really a tribute to my husband. He allowed, he, he empowered me to feel okay and more than okay with our economic circumstance and my ability and desire to earn more and to write about it and to try to empower other people. And in our lives together, you know, we have two children under the age of three and a half. It's a busy, busy time of our lives. This, this part of our timeline is extremely hectic and busy and stressful at times. But when you have the right partner, you find that dance and you make it work and it's not perfect, but you find perfection in the imperfection. Um, and I left my house for two days to go visit a best friend in, in DC and with full confidence in my husband and our nanny and in our children that when I got back, the house would still be intact. And it was, um, the kids, you know, every, it, it, but I, I mean, I cannot do what I do without my husband period. Yeah. yeah. I have filmed a few episodes today and actually everyone has said the people have been what has enabled them to create a life better than their dreams. So I totally echo that. Amazing, Farnoosh. So where can people find you online? You mentioned booktobrand.co, right? Yes. And where yes. else? On that workshop. And if you'd like to listen and subscribe to the podcast, you can go to somoneypodcast.com. I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Having a lot of fun on Instagram. I started <laughs> doing more stories there, and I didn't want to, but I'm just giving the people what they want. <laughs> pictures Thanks of what I'm me. eating, my kids and all of that jazz, but it's been fun to connect with people there. I love the Instagram community. They're so fun. It's just fun. There's no politics. There's no bad news. It's just people having fun. And I think that we need more of that. Agreed. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and everything that you shared has been so inspirational for all of us listening. And truly, I think you're a testament to what happens when you don't give up and you continue to put yourself out there and follow your heart and grow and, and go bigger with every step. And you've inspired me so much um, in my business and to you know really consider when I need to essentially make time for that book because I know it's on my heart. I know it's something that I want to do and that I can do and that I will do. So thank you for that. You're welcome. I'm always here for you. Thanks, Farnoosh. Thanks for having me. Yes. And for everyone listening, I hope you are inspired by Farnoosh and that you move forward with your dreams. You can create a life that's better than your dreams if you start today and take massive action. So until next time, I'm Emily Williams, and this is the I Heart My Life show. I'll look forward to speaking to you very soon. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram at I Heart My Life Now. And did you know, I'm on the radio every single day. Visit AmericaOutloud.com to download the talk radio app so you can tune in at 8 a.m. Eastern and 1 p.m. GMT.